Right, thank you, Marin. Uh, and welcome, everybody, and welcome to those online as well to the uh, third day of the ALT conference. Um, I think we're in for a treat this morning, so it's been well worth getting up after the uh, night before. Um, well, um, it's an absolute privilege this morning to be introducing to you Audrey Waters. Uh, she's come all the way from the West Coast of the United States. Uh, she's an educational writer who uh, some of you may have come across because she's written in many influential publications, uh, including Higher Ed, The Huffington Post, and Educating Modern Learners. Uh, she also tells me she's currently working on a book called Teaching Machines, and uh, that's reflected in the title, so maybe we're going to get a little bit of a sneak preview, I'm not sure. Um, one of the things she does do, uh, which is absolutely fascinating, is write a blog called Hack Education, and I've stolen from there uh, the, uh, the introduction she has to herself in the, in the interest of reusing open resources. I thought rather than write my own, I'll, I'll use hers. So she describes herself there as an education writer, a recovering academic, a serial dropout, a rabble rouser, and some days ed tech Cassandra. Now I confess I had to look up who Cassandra was, um, but it turns out Cassandra was a prophet um, who was cursed by Apollo so that people didn't believe her prophecies. Um, I'm hoping today, uh, Audrey, that the rabble we have for you here uh, will believe some of your prophecies, and I'm sure you'll have some interesting questions and discussions following the, the, the presentation. So I'd like to hand over then to Audrey, and uh, please welcome her to the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, on Monday... Um, uh, driving on our way up here to Coventry, we, and we means myself, my boyfriend, and, and my mum, uh, we stopped at Bletchley Park, um, with the site of the British government's code and cipher school during the Second World War, and the current location of the National Museum in Computing. My boyfriend is accompanying me, as he always does. Um, we travel together, our tech worlds overlap quite nicely. Some of you might know him, Ken Lane, the API evangelist, and he's here because I'm here, but he's also here because he's a huge fan of Martin Hoxie's work. So that was great. And he's also a huge fan of drinking beer with David Kernahan. So he's very, it's very unlike him to sort of miss out on opportunities um, to come to the UK to be with you all. And my mom is here as well because my family, um, her side of the family at least, is from England. And we've reached that sort of difficult part in my granny's life where she's 90 years old and we're sort of rotating through sort of how we can come over from the states um, and be good children and good grandchildren and be um, come visit her. So I told her I was coming over and we sort of timed our visit together which is great because she's also volunteered to drive Ken and I around on the wrong side of the road. So I'm very appreciative, very appreciative of that. So when we were planning the trip, I said to my mom, I said, you know, as we drive up from London, can we please stop at Bletchley Park? Um, and she said casually, oh, I think your grandfather might have worked there. And I said, what? Like, that's a piece of sort of family history I would have, I would have liked to have, to have known about as someone who sort of writes about computers, for, thinks about computers a lot for a living. I mean, I hadn't really thought about it until that moment that there might be a family, a family connection there, but it sort of does make sense. My grandfather was, during the war, was the station commander at Chain Home Low, so um, an early radar development um, where they helped de develop radar, uh, early warning radar base. And he later became the air, um, office, air officer commander in chief at Signals Command. He was knighted for his work actually in developing radar, but I'm not sure he ever really talked that much about it. He certainly, um, he certainly never mentioned, I think, any of the work that he might have done at Bletchley Park. Of course, this was sort of like the huge, the huge secret. In fact, my granny said that during the war, she never knew what he did until afterwards. Um, she never asked. We never talked about it. And he passed away, I think, before we could sort of have any of these conversations that would have been really interesting to me about sort of how does technology, um, how do what we do with computers fit into this other military project. Um, and I'm fascinated by these, by these sorts of stories. Um, the reason that I say I'm ed text Cassandra is definitely in terms of making predictions um, and prophecies about sort of the doom that might be on the horizon. But I'm also a folklorist by training, and I'm very interested in the stories that, the stories that we tell. Um, that is, you know, I mean, that, that's important to me. I'm a folklorist by training. I'm not an instructional designer. I'm not a software engineer. I'm not a business person. I'm not an investor in education technology. Um, I play a journalist on the internet. 
not a computer scientist, I'm a folklorist. I'm interested in stories. As much as sort of our, our disciplinary training sort of helps how we sh help shape how we see the world, I am a folklorist. I am interested in the stories that we tell, particularly the sorts of hidden stories and the forgotten stories and the lost stories, much like sort of my grandfather's involvement, perhaps in Bletchley Park. Um, or more broadly, I think, the way in which we sort of have forgotten to talk about to computer history and surveillance and war. I'm really interested in what stories we tell and whose stories get told, how these stories reflect and I think even sort of construct and shape our world. These are the worlds I think of science and politics, culture and of course education. I try in my work to sort of trace and retrace some of these the connections through some of these different stories, these different narratives, and counter narratives as well. As well. I mean, I, the stories that of business, and then also the stories of, of bullshit, which is a lot of what you hear from the Silicon Valley tech sector. My keynote this morning is gonna try to weave together lots of these different stories to you, and my apologies if you're hungover. If the keynote doesn't make sense, it's actually the, the booze's fault, and not that I'm incoherent. So. <laughs> Um, but I'm trying to pull together stories from history, from literature, and, and from science. So, you know, when I heard that the theme of the conference was riding giants, I confess that I didn't actually think about waves, um, even though I live in Southern California, sort of in the middle of surfer culture. And I didn't think of Isaac Newton's famous saying, standing on the shoulders of giants. I thought about giants the way that a, a folklorist would. Um, so as I was preparing my talk, I think I sort of went off on a different direction with giants. And so what I want to talk to you about this morning is monsters. I want to talk about ed tech's monsters and machines. I want us to think about Bletchley Park, perhaps, on the road to where we are today, thinking about some of the different paths that have got, this, that got us to this place in education technology as well. I mean, no doubt in the last few years we've witnessed a real resurgence in, in interest in education technology. Um, a renewed interest and a growing interest, particularly from those in Silicon Valley. I think that folks here at this conference are certainly well aware that there is a lengthy history to education technology. But many of the folks that I talk to, some of the newest proponents of education technology, particularly in the states, particularly in Silicon Valley, insists that ed tech has no history. Right? They invented it. Um, that there's only now, ed tech only has a now and the future. That there's really nothing to be talked about or learned about from the past. And ed tech now, as they see it, is really closely tied in with venture capital, particularly in the states. And it's sort of a very powerful form of storytelling that many of these ed tech proponents are telling. And sort of the media has picked up a lot of these stories as well. We've sort of seen this in particular with the MOOCs. The storytelling is about sort of this disruptive innovation mythology, entrepreneurial hagiography, right? Design fiction and fantasy. It's really a fantasy about education technology, a fantasy about the computer industry that really wants to sort of stretch its tentacles throughout the world. You know, we've been, we've been given a map in some ways. Society's been handed a map of the world as drawn out now by many of these companies in, in technology. And they sort of want us to talk, think about the ways in which these new, brave new ed tech explorers, these brave new entrepreneurs are gonna sort of conquer lands for us and divide up and rethink and reshape our digital spaces. They're doing this sort of for us. This is their fantasy, right? And they warn us down at the bottom of that map, you know, they warn us of these technologies of the past that perhaps that we should stay away from, the dangerous, unexplored or overly explored places that we should reject because they're stagnant, they're no longer populated, right? There are dragons there. Hic sunt dracones, right? There be dragons down in the forgotten land of forgotten websites. Um, but I actually want us to, I want to argue that we need to face our dragons in education technology. Right? We need to face the monsters that have been created. We need to face the giants. 
and they aren't actually simply on the margins of the maps. These monsters are sort of littered, scattered throughout these lands. So I'm in the middle of writing a book, um, actually, about some of these questions, a book called Teaching Machines. It's a cultural history of the science and politics of education technology. I think it's an anthropology, even, of ed tech. It's a book that looks at sort of knowledge and power and practices, sort of learning and politics and pedagogy. I'm really interested in sort of this long-running push for efficiency, this desire to build machines, sort of the history of education technology throughout the 20th century, pre-computers, that was very much interested in automating instruction. The development of tools like the intelligent tutoring systems, artificially intelligent textbooks, that's one I saw recently, robo-graders, and robo-readers. It involves, I think, some of this does involve a nod to the father of computer science, right, Alan Turing, who worked at Bletchley Park, of course. And his profoundly significant question, can a machine think? And I want to ask in turn, can a machine teach? Right? What happens when and if machines can think? And what happens when and if machines teach? What does that, what happens to labor? What happens to work? And what happens to learning as we start to find these things more and more automated in our lives? And what exactly do we mean by those verbs, right? Think and teach. When we see signs of thinking or teaching in machines, what does that really signal? Does it really signal that machines are becoming more intelligent? Or does it, in fact, signal, perhaps, that humans are becoming more mechanical? Rather than sort of speculate on the future of teaching and machines, I really want to turn back to the past. Because long before Bletchley Park or Alan Turing, machines sort of have spoken in, in binary, in ones and zeros. And quite recently, I literally got tattoos on my forearms um, to sort of remind me as I sit and type on my computer about the way in which machines speak to us. So on my left arm here, I have this, an excerpt from Leaves of Grass. Um, this is Walt Whitman in binary, resist much, obey little, words to live by. And this one, rather more lengthy, from Lord Byron, which is um, from his song of the Luddites, down with all kings, but King Ludd. And I do appreciate the irony, yes I do, of, of a Luddite, song to the Luddites in binary. In, in binary. I'm really interested in these questions, right, around poetry and storytelling and resistance in machines. Lord Byron is a particularly fascinating figure in all of this to me. He was, of course, very, one of the very few defenders of the Luddites. His only appearance in the House of Lords was when he gave a speech challenging the 1812 Frame Breaking Act, which made destruction of the mechanized looms punishable by death. The Luddites were really interesting and sort of maligned, of course, these 19th century artisans who protested against the introduction of factory-owned mechanized machines. They were upset about the labor-saving textile devices. And let's be clear, the emphasis for the Luddites was on the labor part of that problem, not necessarily on the machines. They wanted to protect their livelihoods. They demanded higher wages in a time of economic upheaval, mass unemployment, and of course the long Napoleonic Wars. They were opposed to the factories, not so much because there was technology, but because the corporations owned the technology and the means of production. The Luddites weren't really anti-technology per se, but that's what the word has come to mean. Um, the wonderful Oxford English Dictionary says that Luddites were the original meaning Luddite, a member of the organized band of English mechanics and their friends, 1811 through 1816, who set themselves to destroy manufacturing machinery in the Midlands and the north of England. The etymology from the proper name Ludd with a suffix it. According to Pellew's Life of Lord Sidmouth, Led, Ned Ludd was a person of weak intellect who lived in the Leicestershire village about 1779, who in a fit of insane rage rushed into a stockinger's house, destroyed two frames so completely that saying, Ludd must have been here, came to be used throughout the hosiery districts 
when a stocking frame had undergone extraordinary damage. The story lacks confirmation. It's folklore, right? But it appears that in 1811 through 1813, the nickname Captain Ludd or King Ludd was commonly given to the ringleaders of the Luddites. Ludd was, as this image shows, a giant. Today we use the Luddite, I think, in what you know, the OED calls its transferred sense, one who opposes the introduction of technology specifically into the place of work. The sample usage from the OED entry is from The Economist, of course. Who else would you cite about Luddites but The Economist? From 1986, quote, by suggesting the modern world has lost control of its technology, these accidents help to strengthen the hands of the Luddites, who would halt technology and therefore halt economic growth. And I think that's the way the term is used as this pejorative today. If you question technology, clearly you're against economic growth. To oppose technology, to fear or question automation, some folks like The Economist, venture capitalists Mark Andreessen, for example, they argue that that means you misunderstand how the economy actually works. I would suggest that perhaps the Luddites understood pretty well how the economy works. Um, I would suggest that when it came to questions of who owns the machinery, they sort of nailed it. And I would say that, you know, the economy works quite well for venture capitalists like Mark Andreessen, and maybe we should question that. Um, in 1984, American novelist Thomas Pynchon asked, is it OK to be a Luddite? Suggesting that in the new computer age, it may well be that we have mostly lost our Luddite sensibility. We no longer resist or rage against the machine. But he cautions, someday we might have to. He writes, if our world survives, this is 1984, it was Reagan, Thatcher, it was this question, like if the world survives, right? The next great challenge to watch out for will come, you heard it here first, when the curves of research and development in artificial intelligence, molecular biology, and robotics converge. Oh boy, it will be amazing and unpredictable, and even the biggest of brass, let us devoutly hope, are going to be caught flat-footed. It is certainly something for all good Luddites to look forward to, God willing, should we live so long. And here we are now, 30 years later, from Pinchon's predictions, from Pinchon's essay, facing these pronouncements and predictions again that not just the factory jobs, not just the textile work, but all of our jobs, right, the white collar jobs are on the cusp of being automated. We are entering a new phase in world history, one in which fewer and fewer workers will be needed to produce the goods and services for the global population. That's from Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee in their book, Race Against the Machine. Before the end of the century, says Wired Magazine, 70% of today's occupations will be replaced by automation. The Economist gives a more rapid timeline, as they would. Nearly half of American jobs will be automated in the next decade. So we are, some would say, sort of on this cusp of a great revolution in artificial intelligence and computers and robotics, a great revolution, I suppose, in human labor. Of course, you know, little asterisks that Folks in AI have been predicting a revolution in AI that's always 20 years in the future, always since the beginning of AI. It's always been 20 years off. But there we go. The, it's always on the horizon. It's really for real this time, I'm sure. But like I said, you know, these technological stories that we tell, they are fantasy. They are fantastic, always on the future. And I think we do have to thank Alan Turing for laying some of the philosophical groundwork for artificial intelligence. And of course, sort of ironically, despite the sort of affinity with the Luddites, we do have to thank Lord Byron. Um, he was the father of Ada Lovelace, right? Who is generally considered the first computer programmer. She worked with Charles Babbage on his analytical engine. And I love, again, I love these sorts of 
comments. The one of the few people to stand up for the Luddites gave birth to the person who sort of brought us to this, to this world today. And I think Byron is interesting too because you know now as we celebrate 200 years of Luddites, we're actually coming up on another bicentenary in a couple of years as well that Byron was there for as well that summer when he and a group of small friends, Percy Shelley, John William, Paul Dory, Claire Cl Claremont, and Mary Godwin, they spent the summer of 1816 in Lake Geneva, Switzerland, a wet, ungenial summer, said Mary, when they all decided to try their hands at writing ghost stories. And there, Mary Godwin, later Mary Shelley, wrote Frankenstein, first published in 1818, arguably the first work of science fiction, certainly one of the most important and influential texts when we think about what it means to have science and technology and monsters come together. Monsters, of course, it's important to think monsters. Frankenstein is about monsters and not machines. However much of Frankenstein's longevity is owing to the unsung genius of James Whale, who translated it into film, Thomas Pynchon says in his essay about Luddites, it remains more than worthwhile reading. For all the reasons that we read novels, as well as for the much more limited question of its Luddite value. That is, for its attempt through literary means, which are nocturnal and deal with danger, to deny the machine. It's really interesting because while the lab visualized in James Whale's great 1931 movie is full of equipment, full of equipment, the novel itself actually has very, very little machines in it. I think there's a passing mention of something that does, creates the galvanic twitch, right? That was sort of able to sort of lurch and bring the creation to life. But really the novel doesn't do all of this fancy laboratory work. Pynchon argues that it's actually really important that there's very little technology, very little machinery in the novel. He says that this sort of represents the Gothic interest in rejecting the future of science, returning to an age of miracles. To insist on the miracles, argues Pynchon, is to deny the machine, at least some of its claims on us, to assert the limited wish that living beings, earthly or otherwise, may on occasion become bad and big enough to take part in transcendence. Even without machines, however, Frankenstein is always read as this cautionary tale about science and about technology. The story has left sort of an indelible impression upon us. We use Franken now as the sort of shorthand to refer to all sorts of things that we find to be abominations, right? Franken food and Franken fish. The monster, this monstrosity is sort of like this technological crime against nature. And I think it's telling, it's very telling that often in popular um, parlance that we confuse the scientist Victor Frankenstein, with the creature. We call the creature itself Frankenstein. The sociologist Bruno Latour argued that we don't actually merely make that mistake. It's not merely a matter of making the mistake of confusing the monster with the scientist, but we actually get the whole crime wrong. It was not that Frankenstein invented a creature through some combination of hubris and technology says Latour, but rather the crime was that he abandoned the creature to itself. The creature, again, a giant, insists in the novel that he was not born a monster. He became monstrous after Frankenstein fled the laboratory in horror when the creature opened his dull yellow eyes, convulsed and breathed. Remember that I am thy creature, he says when he confronts Frankenstein in the Alps, I ought to be thy Adam, but rather I am the fallen angel whom thou divest from joy for no misdeed. Everywhere I see bliss, but from which I am alone, I alone am irrevo irrevocably excluded. I was benevolent and good. Misery made me a fiend. 
Latour says, written at the dawn of the great sort of technological revolutions that would define the 19th and 20th century, Frankenstein foresees the gigantic sins that were to be committed that would hide a much greater sin. It is not the case that we have failed to care for creation. It is that we have failed to care for our technological creations. We confuse the monster with, the, with his creator. We blame our sins against nature upon our technological creations. But our sin is not that we've created technologies, but we have failed to love and care for our technologies. It is if we have decided that we were unable to follow through with the education of our children. Our gigantic sin, again, is that we fail to love and care for our technological creations. We must love and educate our children. And we must love and care for our machines, lest they become monsters. Indeed, Frankenstein is also a novel about education. Right? The novel is structured as a series of narratives about education. Captain Walton, who writes letters back to his sister, talks about his education. Inside, that's the story of Victor Frankenstein and his education. Tucked inside of that is the story of the, of the cre creature and his education that he learns from observing people. It's the story of you know, what happens when science goes awry, but it's also the story of what happens when education goes awry when education isn't about guidance and love and care and support. Oh, that I had remained forever in my native wood, nor known or felt beyond the sensations of hunger, thirst, and heat, the creature says. In his article, Love Your Monsters, Bruno Latour says that Frankenstein is a good parable for thinking about political ecology. Again, the lesson isn't that we should step away from technology. It's not that we should sort of reject innovation or reject science, but rather we have to sort of strengthen our commitment to our patience with our political commitment to all of creation. Capital C creation now includes our science and our machines. Frankenstein, I think, might also be an interesting parable for education technology in the same way. What are we going to make of EdTech's monsters? What are we going to do about our machines? Is there something to be said about pedagogy, technology, and what we're seeing increasingly, perhaps, as an absence of care? We have 200 years of Luddites. We have 200 years of Frankenstein. And by my calculations, at least, we have about 150 years of building teaching machines. To be clear, I think when I give a nod to Luddites and to Frankenstein, again, it's not about rejecting technology, it's not about rejecting science, but it is about rejecting exploitation. It's about rejecting what's become really an uncritical and unexamined belief that these technologies sort of equal progress. The problem isn't, again, that science gives us monsters, it's that we have pretended like science is sort of divorced from our responsibility divorced from love, divorced from politics, that science gives us the truth. The problem isn't, again, that science gives us monsters, but that it actually doesn't give us answers either. And that's, I think, the problem with ed tech's monsters. That's the problem with teaching machines. They want us to have precise truth answers. They're built on this idea that if we're to automate education, we have to see knowledge in a certain way. We have to see knowledge as sort of atomistic, fixed, hierarchical, measurable, non-negotiable. In order to make a lot of our education technologies, we've come to view the world as a very fixed thing. I, I love putting these three images on the slide. I'm sorry. That's, my apologies go out to the Skinner family, except not really. Um, so although teaching machines do predate his work by almost a century, they are most commonly associated with wonderfully bad guy looking up on the top right hand side, Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner. And here's an excerpt from wonderfully evil looking Ayn Rand about Skinner. She's describing his 1971 book, 
beyond freedom and dignity. The book itself, she says, is like Boris Karloff's embodiment of Frankenstein's monster. It's a corpse patched with nuts, bolts, screws from the junkyard of philosophy, pragmatism, social Darwinism, positivism, linguistic analysis with some nails made by Hume, some threads by Bertrand Russell, and glue from the New York Post. No one ever better review my book like that. The book's voice, like Karloff's, is an emission of inarticulate moaning growls directed at a special enemy, autonomous man. Now, I, I quote Rand's criticism here, of course, because she invokes Frankenstein's outfits quite nicely. But I, and I'm really fascinated by the fact that she's sort of arguing, here we go, that B.F. Skinner, this really monumental figure in education technology and education psychology is Frankenstein, right? He is, and that he's created his science behaviorism is this misbegotten creature from a misbegotten science. B.F. Skinner is Frankenstein, and I think that it's interesting how she sort of plays into this notion of the film that he's playing God, right? He dares play God, that his creations are monsters with, and it, Skinner is fixated on control, a rejection of freedom, and the absence of emotion or care. Of course, but I do quote Ayn Rand before you're all horrified. I quote her with a great deal of irony, of course, um, this, because the, part, the Silicon Valley tech industry right now could not be more fascinated with, with her. Um, the, the valley right now is full of these sort of laissez-faire objectivist, libertarian capitalists who really are embracing her vision of, of the world, which I would argue is monstrous in its own right. You know, Rand uses Skinner as a way to sort of say, this is why we actually can't have federal funding of science. She says that in her book review. This is a great example of why the government needs to not be involved with research and we need to open up science to the free marketplace of ideas. And the free marketplace of ideas will make sure that nonsense like behaviorism never um, will, will sort of lose. Of course, again, ironically, the free marketplace of ideas that libertarians love right now is really chock full of behaviorist crap. She criticizes Skinner, right, that there is no freedom that Skinner always wants to control us, lead our lives sort of controlled by sort of scientific management, by technocrats who know best, who, with, but are offering us positive reinforcement. You know, it's, um, she says that she will not stand for this, but these behaviorist technologies are thrown throughout the technologies that we use today, right? Gamification, notifications, nudges, no surprise, of course, because of the rejection of history, many folks in Silicon Valley don't actually know who B.F. Skinner is and wouldn't know behaviorism if it bit them. The Turing test, of course, right, the sort of fundamental thing in artificial intelligence is in many ways a behaviorist test. As Alan Turing said, the question isn't really can a machine think, but can a machine exhibit behaviors, behaviors, that convince a human, fool a human, into thinking it is one as well. Again, monsters and machines. Before developing Teaching Machines, our friend B.F. Skinner here worked on a number of projects, inventing as part of his graduate work with the now, what's now known as the Skinner Box around 1930, the operant conditioning chamber which he used to study and train animals to perform certain tasks. You do it correctly, you get a reward, just like so much ed tech today. I mean, not literally candy, often. During World War II, my favorite Skinner story, he actually worked on Project Pigeon, an experimental project to create pigeon-guided missiles. I'm not lying, truly. I cannot begin to tell you how much I wish I could talk to my grandfather about the development of radar and his thoughts on 
pigeon-guided missiles. I mean, even more than talking to him about Bletchley Park, I would love to have his thoughts on pigeons and war. Um, but the military actually canceled that project. They canceled and revived the pigeon project several times. Our problem, said Skinner, was that no one would take us seriously. <laughs> but by 1953, the military had devised sort of machines that would guide missiles, and we no longer needed to re rely on animals to, um, to guide the machines. That same year, 1953, Skinner visited his fourth grade daughter's classroom and came up with the idea for the teaching machine. He was struck when he visited her classroom on how inefficient it was. Not only were the students expected to move through their lessons at the same pace, but when it came to assignments and quizzes, they actually had to wait sometimes a day, a whole day, to get the feedback from their teachers. Um, Skinner believed that these were sort of the flaws in schools that could be addressed through automation, through a machine. So we built a prototype that he demonstrated at a psychology conference the next year. All these elements are part of B.F. Skinner's teaching machines, right? The eliminations of efficiencies that come with human teachers, the delivery of immediate feedback, the ability for students to move at their own pace. I think today, education technologists call that personalization. Addressing social problems, including problems like school, said Skinner, meant addressing behaviors. As he wrote in Beyond Freedom and Dignity, we need to make vast changes in human behaviors. What we need is a technology of behavior. Teaching machines, he said, would be one such technology. Teaching with or without machines, Skinner said, would, was reliant on contingencies of enforcement. Right? The problem with human teachers, he argued, is that they just weren't consistent about how they reinforce things. They didn't reinforce right away like a machine could. Like I said, sometimes there was a delay between when the t a student would do something and when they would figure out whether or not they were right or wrong. Um, also, the teachers, he said, were too often focused on punishing bad behaviors rather than rewarding good behaviors. Anyone who visits the lower trades of the average school today will observe that a change has been made not from aversive to positive control, but from one form of aversive stimulation to another, Skinner writes. With the application of behaviorism and the development of teaching machines, there is no reason, he insisted, quote, why the schoolroom should be any less mechanized than the kitchen. I mean, maybe there are reasons, I would like to think, that maybe monsters and Luddites can help us form a better response. According to Google Ngrams, which is one of my favorite um, non-scientific tools to play with, um, it's the tool that tracks sort of the frequency of words within the corpus that Google has, Google has digitized. Digitized, as you can sort of see, as society became more and more industrialized, we sort of talked about Luddites increasingly over the years. The pattern is sort of the same. Until, interestingly, the turn of the century, turn of the 21st century, when according to Google at least, and I'm sure that they have no interest in, um, in making it look this way, and sort of to paraphrase Dr. Strangelove, I think we had stopped worrying and came to love the machine. But by love here, I do wonder if we'd mean instead fascination, an attachment with the shiny and the new. We've acquiesced, perhaps. We're no longer engaging. We're no longer engaging in our technologies scientifically, politically, or sociolog sociologically. And again, this is not what Bruno Latour meant when he said we should love our monsters. As our interest in Luddites seemingly declines, I fear we do face what Frankenstein counseled against, a refusal to take responsibility. We see technology as this autonomous creation that's going to sort of enter the world and move society forward without any guidance under its own steam. Wired Magazine's Kevin Kelly is probably the best example of this. And 
He said in his book, What Technology Wants, he says, technology has its own wants. It wants to sort itself out. It wants to self-assemble into hierarchies, not just the most large and deeply, as most large, deeply interconnected systems do. It wants what every living system wants. It wants to perpetuate itself. It wants to keep going. As technology grows, these wants are gaining in complexity and force. That is monstrous, I think. That is Frankenstein's monster. Kelly writes, we can choose to modify our legal, political, and economic assumptions to meet the ordained trajectories of technology, but we cannot escape what technology wants. We should just throw up our hands, I guess. Surrender. Surrender to progress, surrender to the machine. It's a sleight of hand, of course. It's a sleight of hand to suggest that Technological changes are what technology wants. It's an argument that, just, that sort of obscures what industry wants, what business wants, what systems, power wants. I think it's an intellectually disingenuous and perhaps politically dangerous argument to make. What does a teaching machine want, for example? What does a teaching machine demand? I want to echo what Catherine said yesterday when she said that education demands our interest and our engagement. I'll insist to you that technology demands our political interest and political engagement. To echo Latour, our sins are not that we have created technologies, but that we have failed to love and care for them. It is as if we would have decided we were unable to follow through on the education of our children. Political interest, political engagement is love, right? It is love for the world. Love and a little bit of Luddism. I want to leave you with one final quotation from Hannah Arendt who wrote, education is the point at which we decide whether or not we love the world. And that's to res assume responsibility for it. And by the same token, save it from that ruin which, except for renewal, except for the coming of the new and young, would be inevitable. Education, too, is where we decide whether we love our children enough not to expel them from our world, right? Frankenstein's sin. And leave them to their own devices, nor to strike from their hands their chance of undertaking something new, something unforeseen by us, but to prepare children in advance for the task of renewing our common world. That is our task, I believe, to tell the stories, to build the society that would place education technology in that same light, to renew our common world. We in education, I think we have to face these monsters that we've created, these monsters that we've inherited. We've inherited monsters from the technologies in Bletchley Park We've inherited monsters from mass production and standardization. We've inherited monsters in education technology from behaviorism and control. These are the monsters I think we have to face. We have to consider what monsters education technology lives with. We have to face them, we have to confront them, and we have to make sure we are engaged politically so we are not creating more monsters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Audrey, for that <laughs> fascinating, inspiring uh, journey through stories and history. Uh, ben Steeples has tweeted while he's been talking that he's still going to be talking about that in six months' time. <laughs> uh, but we do have a few minutes to sort of start the conversations now. So I'd like to invite any uh, comments or questions. We have um, questions as well from our online audience. Uh, kind of who's got the online uh, link at the end? OK. Right, well, we'll start with the hall, I think. Does anybody like to start us off with some questions or comments? <coughs> One at the back there. OK. Yes. Our monsters are slightly different ones. 
So yes, there's been the narrative about efficiency and evidence base, particularly since the new Labour government, but we've just been much less good at it. Um, <laughs> educational research is much more qualitative and humanist and participative <coughs> in the UK tradition. And you know, the EdTech project has been more focused on the student experience and enhancing academic practice. So though we, we have monsters, I mean, I, I wonder if you'd recognize that they're slightly different ones. No, I think that that's actually, a really, that's actually a really great observation. It's one of the things that frightens me very much is that as we, um, as we in the U.S. export our technologies, that, they are, that we're exporting with that oftentimes the ideology that comes with technologies, right? So that um, it is a sort of a, a form of, it's a different sort of form of imperialism. I wouldn't call it sort of necessarily cultural imperialism, but it is sort of like this imperialism at the level of infrastructure that I worry, um, I worry deeply that sort of other countries are not just adopting our ridiculously horrid education policy, which um, Gove seemed to do that quite well, um, following the US's ridiculous education policies. But I worry that as sort of we spread these new technologies, and MOOCs are a great example of that, is that we sort of spread these um, throughout the world, um, Google, Facebook, all of these, that they carry with them these other sorts of um, this other ideology, particularly the sort of radical individualism that is very much um, a, a Randian project, but it's very much an American project as well. That's a great point. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad you have different monsters, I guess. <laughs> I, I think it's a really, really good point about the um, importance of storytelling and the stories that we tell. Um, and one interesting reflection, I, I think the sort of fashionableness of MOOCs um, in, in, the, in the UK amongst policymakers came partly from David Willett, the minister, sort of visiting California and getting caught up in the excitement of the venture capitalists and the story that these exciting new technologies are coming from the venture capitalists of California, which of course probably most of us would tell a very different story about uh, about that. And I'm kind of reflecting on, on the story told last year actually at this conference by Wendy Hall about openness and perhaps um, the most significant thing about um, the um, invention of the web in T Tim Berners-Lee making that open, deciding that there wasn't going to be any monetary value attached to it. It was part of the human intellectual commons and I'm just sort of wondering how we tell that sort of counter story about openness and its real value um, in, a, in, in an effective way. I think that this is, I mean I think that this is one of the great, the great challenges that um, those of us that work in education and know the different stories sort of we're faced with um, when, you know, particularly when, when journalists find find the stories that the, the venture capitalists and technology sector tell very compelling, right? School is broken, someone should fix it, buy my product. It's a great, it, it fits quite nicely into the three paragraph story that, that sort of journalists tell. And I think that that is our challenge is to be able to sort of prevent, present the counter narrative and present it powerfully. I mean, I, I think fortunately we have access to um, you know, I think social media sort of can help sort of crack open the sort of dominant, the dominant narrative. We're able to sort of tell our, tell our own stories through our own voices now. But I do think the challenge is to sort of also be able to sort of tell that story at the, at the not national, popular, mainstream media level as well. Even if, you know, so it's sort of like all of us have to do a better job of, um, of sort of making sure that our friends in journalism don't fall, don't fall prey to the sort of this grand narrative that thank goodness for fill in the blank um, person from Stanford University who's going to rescue us from, from, um, from, our, you know, from our failure, to, from, from our institution's failure to move forward. And many of us within, within education, I think, see the interesting innovations that happen all the time. They just don't look like the story that the media tells. Um, I, I think that's a, a fantastic perspective on actually how we as education and technologists regard history in many ways. Um, ten years ago, I showed um, a 
group of Chinese teachers around UK schools to look at how, sorry, to, to look at how um, education technology was being used to improve teaching. And, and these were people who um, typically taught between 90 and 120 children in a class. And, you know, if anybody was out of line, they put them in the corridor and they got beaten. And, and you know, so there were, there were some downsides to the way they taught, but it was very effective. Um, and what was, what was in, you know, going in and, and looking honestly and objectively at what was going on in the EdTech um, at the time when the government was putting lots of money into it, it was very clear that a lot of the things that were being done were being done because there was a technology that needed to be sold, not because there was a learning outcome that was going to be delivered better than by a human being communicating, intuiting, um, understanding, caring, um, you know, reading eyes, looking at attention spans and all of those kinds of things. And, and, and the quality of the teaching wasn't improved by the technology. And um, we, we, as technologists, we can say, you're not adopting the technology. If teachers had adopted the technology when they were given it, every time they were given it, no teaching would have gone on at all. And, and um, that, that the sort of, the, the, the humility of understanding that the best teachers, the, pe the best teaching that goes on is, you know, with one person, with another person. Um, and whatever is being um, taught objectively, so much subjective stuff is going on, and that's, you know, that's real learning that's going on. And as you're saying, sort of exercising one tiny muscle isn't keeping anybody fit and, and just breaking everything down into binary, you've learned this, yes, no, let's move on. Um, th that, that perspective on what we're doing is extremely refreshing and, and, and you know, I think can't be said often enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think it's interesting that you know, oftentimes I notice that um, the, the technology is often, I mean, and, and not, just, not just education technology, but in general, technology is sort of often used to make the practices that we already do just work a little bit more efficiently. We can do it faster, better, stronger. Um, perhaps some promise um, more cheaply, but usually um, a, just a new set of people profit from it. And I think that one of the challenges should be to how does technology transform our practice? It isn't simply how do we use technology to do that old thing, but just in a new, like, you know, from move from print textbooks to textbooks on an iPad is not actually that exciting. I mean, it's exciting for Apple and Pearson because they want us to buy their new thing. But it's not actually a trans transformation the way in which some of the, poten the potential to do things really differently. Oh, right. Thank you. Nigel Ecclesfield from JISC. I'm very interested in the way in which you're starting to look at the vocabulary adopted by Silicon Valley and trying to reclaim perfectly good words from the way in which they've been jargonized and colonized by the followers of Ayn Rand and others. So it brings to my mind George Bush's wonderful comment that the problem with the French is they didn't have a word for entrepreneur. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm particularly exercised by a term that's come out of the States from Harvard, mm -hmm. public value. And I blog quite a lot on that because I think that both of those words need reclaiming from the Harvard people who see public value as designed and developed by senior managers in public services. I feel that somewhere, like in education, the learners and the practitioners have a role in defining what the policies are. But we're in a position at the moment where even in the operations of the great free services like Google, what we're coming to be able to access and use is what the algorithms have decided we should know and use. And it's really useful and very positive today to have somebody who comes in to reclaim good words like Luddite. And I think just, just to finish, one of the great things that the Luddites did when they were campaigning before they started machine smashing was to propose in the economy that there'd be a small tax on the cloth produced in the new machines in order to re-educate, retrain, and re-employ those people who were being thrown out of work in the cottage industries. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think I'm, I'm really interested in the Luddites as well. This notion, 
something that's also really important to me is thinking about how can we how can we sort of reclaim reclaim technologies. So instead of sort of giving up more and more of our personal data, more and more of our content to these large providers, be they Facebook or um, Blackboard or Google, that we sort of have better control and understanding of technology. And I think that that's, I mean, that's an interesting lesson for the Luddite, from the Luddites as well. It's not about being opposed to mechanized looms. The problem was when Google owns the mechanized looms. The problem isn't, the, the problem isn't in the web. The problem is when the web becomes Google and Facebook. And so how do we rest back, um, rest back control of the, of the technological production so that um, so that we have it again, that it's not controlled by sort of the new, the new factories, the Google factory. Mm -hmm. uh, a quick question to Rita, so I think in the interest of, of keeping the, uh, the next session very tight, we'll have to stop there. Um, but please, uh, all get your rest, but please continue talking with her, and I'm sure you'll be able to communicate with her through a blog and on Twitter yes, as well. So we'll <laughs> so could you join me again, please, in thanking Audrey for... Thank you. Thank you.